Good morning, everyone. I am Raymond Gilpin, and I lead USIP's work on sustainable economies. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for this morning's discussion, which will be focused around USAID's Community Stabilization Program in Iraq. Um, this program has two broad aims, creating employment and raising uh, incomes on the one hand, and reaching out to youth on the other. And these are two critical elements of any socioeconomic recovery program. And um, being able to understand and analyze economic recovery programs in challenging environments is something that has challenged um, the brightest of minds and the best intentioned professionals for quite a while. Uh, last month, USIP partnered with uh, Columbia University and uh, in organizing a seminar on peace through economic reconstruction. And this um, event focused on smart ways to use economic levers to ensure that once violence abates in a challenging environment, we could do all that we can to bring economic outcomes and economic uh, reconstruction projects to communities as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, speaking as the event, the director of the, of the Center for Capitalism and Society at um, Columbia University, who also happens to be the 2006 Nobel winner in economics, Professor Ed Phelps, highlighted the importance of effective economic efforts shortly after the cessation of um, hostilities in order to deliver tangible peace dividends. Um, Earth Institute Director Jeffrey Sachs also echoed this sentiment and described the immediate post-violence era as, quote-unquote, the early development phase. He described this phase as a phase that is an orphan in international development because there is no one institution or no one policy framework that focus, focuses specifically on the immediate post-violence era in countries and communities. And uh, not, not, on, not uh, coincidentally, this um, immediate post-violence phase um, is very similar to the hold phase in counterinsurgency because those of you familiar with counterinsurgency strategy will recognize the clear hold and build. And in the hold phase, you have two competing objectives, um, delivering tangible peace dividends as quickly as you could, but also doing all you could to, re, um, to prevent those communities or those areas from sliding back into violence. And in many ways, the CSP as a counterinsurgency tool was designed against that background. Um, this morning, uh, we have a very capable panel who would help us analyze these issues and potential tensions and answer questions like, how effective was the CSP in Iraq? Is this a model we should be thinking about in other conflict-affected countries? Should development initiatives have military objectives? And how do we measure success when we have dual objectives, both development and security? Um, I'm very, very um, happy that I will not be the one who will be tackling these very challenging questions, um, but we have a number of very um, informed and capable speakers. Um, you have their bios, so I wouldn't go into um, excruciating detail. I'll just introduce them in the manner in which they would speak, in the order in which they would speak, sorry. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our main presenter, um, Jean Pryor, who is Deputy Director of the Office of Iraq Reconstruction at USAID. I know some of you might be a tad confused because you may have received emails saying Office of Iraq Reconstruction at the Department of State. And for the record, uh, Mia Culpa, who is an uh, army mistake, and she is and always has been with uh, USAID. I thank you very much um, to Jean for presenting, and she will talk us through um, the CSP, um, what they found, and their assessment of progress on the ground. Um, following that, we would have um, four discussants, um, Randall Rahim, one of ours, a former 
Randolph Jennings, Senior Fellow at USIP, but currently Executive Director of the Iraq Foundation and former representative of Iraq to the United States. Um, she will be followed by Lieutenant Colonel Sean Bernabe, who is Director of Academic Operations at the, at the U.S. Army Command and Staff General School. Uh, thank you very much. He has a lot of um, in-country experience with the CSP, which we look, to, um, look forward to benefiting from. Then we have um, Dr. Heather Hansen, who is Director of Public Affairs at Mercy Corps, an NGO with a lot of experience in Iraq, but one that did not uh, participate in the CSP. So we'd, we would look, we're looking, we would, would appreciate her uh, comments from her vantage point. And uh, the fourth discussant would be um, Dr. Nabil al also a former USIP fellow, but currently Assistant Professor of Middle Eastern History at the University of Mary Washington. And following the four discussants, we will have um, brief remarks by Dr. Arthur B. Keyes, President and CEO of International Relief and Development. Uh, thank you very much for coming in at the very last moment, Dr. Keyes. And uh, he, his organization was an implementing agent of the CSP in Iraq, and we look forward to your, to your remarks. Um, our aim is to keep the um, discussion as focused and as uh, brief as possible, so we'll have an opportunity to interact with the panelists. And so without much more ado, I'd inv invite um, Jean Pryor to uh, the podium. But before she takes the podium, I'd like to um, appeal to all owners of cell phones, pagers, if it beeps, squeaks, or squawks, um, please turn it off because it does interfere with our PA system and uh, it also and also out of um, out of um, uh, respect to our panelists as they prepare. So, once more, Jean Pryor. Okay. Let's see. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay, I'd like to thank Raymond and USIP for providing us this opportunity to discuss the evaluation of the Community Stabilization Program and the role that development as assistance can play in counterinsurgency efforts. Uh, the evaluation offered us internally in aid a number of really interesting issues and sparked a lot of debate. Um, this is a very novel, innovative <coughs> approach for USAID. While the Community Stabilization Pro Program does use traditional development assistance activities and approaches, you know, job creation, training, community development. What makes it different for USAID is the close co collaboration we had with the U.S. military and how we were targeting communities with the specific purpose of helping to the military stabilize them. Uh, Raymond did an excellent job describing the counterinsurgency strategy of clear, hold, build, and how the community stabilization program relates to that. So I will go on to do the next slide. CSP was a three-year, $650 million program implemented by IRD. Uh, the scale of this is unusual for USAID. Now, $650 million is oftentimes the appropriation for an entire continent in USAID's portfolio, let alone one program in three years. Uh, at its height, it was dispersing about a million dollars a day, and frankly, we're starting to feel like the Defense Department with that kind of money. <laughs> there are a number of aid countries that only get a million dollars a year. Uh, as it notes up here, CSP is a non-lethal counterinsurgency program that reduces the incentives for participation in violent conflict through creating employment and engaging youth. Uh, there are four components to CSP. Uh, the first one, especially right in the aftermath of kinetic operations, is community infrastructure and essential services. Uh, it has two purposes. It provides activities for young men, keep them busy, gets cash into the economy, as well as jumpstart essential services in the community and give them some hope of a better future. There's also a vocational training and apprenticeship component that's very important. Many of the people in these communities lack the necessary skills to be able to have, uh, you know, get long-term jobs. Uh, and then following that, the business development program issued micro-grants to businesses so that they could either, say, rebuild in the aftermath of a suicide bomb or, or start up a business or expand their business. And then finally, also the youth activities. Again, 
you know, a, a, I'm a parent of an adolescent, and again, it's all about keeping them busy so they don't get into trouble. Uh, and the activities range from you know, leadership development to art projects and to lots of sports activities. Okay. Um, I guess we can go to the next slide. And this kind of lays out you know, it, how it was all supposed to link together, starting off with the community infrastructure, moving to vocational training, business development, and youth activities all along the way. Um, the next slide. I love this picture. It says it all on what the community stabilization program has done in Iraq in these violence-prone areas. And the next. In, in looking at the results of this program, I, I think they're, they're substantial. There's 10,300 new businesses. There were 339,000 young people engaging in different kinds of activities. Uh, Ten and a half million dollar, ten and a half million man days of employment, critical in that immediate aftermath of a kinetic operation. Again, build that infrastructure back, shop, back up, get cash into the economy. Uh, and it was broad in that it operated in 18 different locations. However, you know, these are all outputs. And ultimately, what really makes the difference is what is the outcome. You know, it's nice that you can create a lot of mandates of labor and train a lot of people, but so what? And one of the purposes of the evaluation was to help us see what was the so what. Did we have a larger impact? Um, this evaluation is an independent evaluation that was done by IBTCI and it reflects their findings and their recommendations. You say neither endorses nor uh, rejects them, but it is food th for thought for all of us. You know, the most important question is, is, was the community stabilization program effective? Is it a viable model for counterinsurgency programming elsewhere? What are the lessons learned? What are the best practices that we can take forward as we look at counterinsurgency programming in other country contexts? And as this is largely uncharted territory for, for you, say, we felt it was important to try and document it and get these lessons learned as best as possible. What the evaluation did find was, bottom line, it worked. And all four components worked. Uh, polling data, in addition to the outputs that had been measured, uh, reported that you know beneficiaries did notice a positive impact in their community. There's some analysis that's going on now that is trying to see the correlation between CSP work and incidents of violence in those neighborhoods. But we, I don't think we have that data just just yet. But it'll be very interesting when it does come out. Uh, the evaluation team did recommend that it be re replicated elsewhere. Of course, you know, tweaked for the specific country context, and also you know, adapting some of the lessons learned that came out of the evaluation. Now, there's something like 20-some recommendations in the evaluations, in the evaluation, and all are interesting, and I highly recommend you read the evaluation if you haven't already. You can find it on the USAID website under the, the deck. Um, most of the evaluations are, are good common sense and definitely practices we will want to embrace in future programming. But some of the evaluations really got us thinking about some difficult issues. CSP was designed with stabilization in mind, not necessarily long-term sustainable development. However, as the program unfolded, you know, we and IRD were encountering that, well, okay, that's great, we're doing these trash campaigns. Um, who's going to do it after this program ends? This is a three-year program. Okay, vocational training, getting lots of people trained. Who's going to carry it on after it ends? And there's just an inevitable tension between balancing stabilization priorities as well as development priorities. How do you work those in? It's all well and good to say, okay, we're going to transition trash off to the Iraqi government at some point in time, but if you're setting this program up in a kinetic operation, who are you working with? What are the issues that are involved? It makes for planning to be very, very challenging. And as you know, development practitioners know, the ownership of a program from the beginning is really key. But CSP is operating oftentimes not so much in post-kinetic environments, but in the thick of it. Monitoring and oversight in insecure environments. Um, 
To say that it is a challenge to monitor in insecure environments is an understatement. In a place like Iraq, where the violence could be so severe, U.S. government security regimen just did not allow us to go out and monitor our programs the way we would traditionally do so. You have the added impact that, you know, if an American shows up at a, a project site, it can put any Iraqi who is working with that project at risk. So how do you make sure the work is getting done like it's supposed to, the funds are being used appropriately? Now, USAID has employed a number of different techniques to try and do that monitoring, evaluation, and oversight. And IRD has as well, and Arthur can, can speak to those. Um, we have three sets of auditors who review our programs. USAID's own inspector general is based right in our aid compound in Baghdad doing concurrent audits with us. Um, we also rely on our PRT representatives who can get out a little bit more easily than our staff in the green zone to be able to also go out and monitor. But again, you know, there's still restrictions. We have to be mindful of the security of the Iraqis who are working on these projects. We also tried something innovative. We had set up a project specifically for this purpose, monitoring and evaluation. And the implementers, IBTCI, who also did this evaluation, and their staff was overwhelmingly Iraqi, and they had the freedom of movement to be able to put you know, eyes on to our projects. So they had access to thousands of CSP activities and could get a sense of whether or not they were happening and what the impact was. But, you know, for example, even our auditors have challenges going out. You know, all of our auditors, the GAO, the SIGR, and the IG, all are U.S. government personnel and as such are subject to the same security restrictions. So it's not uncommon for us to have audits of our programs and the auditors haven't even seen those programs ourselves. So this independent mechanism for project monitoring turned out to be very important. Because CSP is innovative and new and risky, uh, we subjected it to more than the norm in terms of evaluations and audits. I think we did a total of 16 different evaluations on the program and I think it's about four or five audits over the life of the program. Mind you, this is a three-year program, so that's a lot of monitoring. Metrics, again, that question, how do we know that we've been successful? And in an coin environment, there are a number of different actors. It's, just not you, it's not just you say, you have the military, you have the State Department and their political engagement in these communities. You have Iraqi security forces and local Iraqi leaders, whether they're government officials or civil society or the private sector. And how do we determine which intervention was most successful? I'd like to think that it's probably the combination of all of us, but it's hard to tease out you know, what we at AID could take credit for with this program. And uh, you know, AID, in, in terms of me measuring success in our other programs, we're always looking for what, what specifically can we attribute to our, our programming. And then how do you define success? You know, obviously we have a lot of numbers in terms of people trained, and then you have the overarching goal of increased stability in a neighborhood. But what's the in-between so that we can measure our progress along the way to know that if we're having the appropriate impact in that community? So we are looking for all ideas in terms of what kind of metrics could be used. The evaluation also made the point of doing a better job of getting baselines, and we actually questioned the team quite a bit on this. Um, you know, in our view, how do you get a baseline in Ramadi when the surge was starting up? You know, what kind of baseline are you going to get anyway in the midst of a conflict? The market's not functional. Is that the baseline? Is that really an accurate baseline? Um, so we still struggle with, you know, what is the starting point for us in which we will base the measures of success? All right, now for the real controversial issue. What is the acceptable level of risk? And there are two components to that physical risk to staff, and also financial risk. Um, we can have all kinds of discussions and debates on how we can better implement and better monitor you know, these kinds of programs, especially in insecure settings, but at the end of all those discussions is a life. There is someone who is putting themselves in harm's way to implement it, and some numbers I want to share to kind of put it all in perspective. Um, on USAID programs alone, amongst our implementing partner staff, 122 have been killed. This is just Iraq. 112 have been wounded. 50 have been kidnapped. And that doesn't include all the threats and intimidations and assassination attempts. You know, we, we just lose count of those. 
Um, so anything that we decide has to be balanced against the risk we are putting people in. And overwhelmingly, these are Iraqis who are at risk because they are the ones who can best reach out to these communities. And that also ties in with monetary risk. Um, many developing countries have a culture in which patronage is an accepted practice. And we here in the West consider that corruption. And it's one thing to be able to say to a local staff, it's not okay to hire your brother. It's not okay to just give a contract to your cousin. We consider that corruption. But in a, a conflict environment like CSP operates, it's a little different factor. Uh, the issue can also then become you have uh, a CSP employee getting ready to issue a construction contract who's approached by a, a gentleman who says, you know, I have a construction company and I would like to win this contract. Oh, by the way, my cousin heads up the local militia. So <laughs> there becomes a new level of risk for employees. It also then in turn puts monetary risk on the program. You know, I, I wish I could say that, you know, every single penny would be properly accounted for, but in an insecure environment, I don't think we can realistically do that. We do our absolute best trying to prevent fraud and abuse in these kinds of programs. And over the life of CSP, USAID and IRD work very closely together along with our auditors to continue to refine the different checks and balances and processes to help make sure that taxpayer dollars are used for the purposes intended and used wisely. But again, you know, if you're overlaying a war on an assistance program, how do we ensure that? Is it realistic to ensure that? Also, you know, as I talk about the physical risk, there are many NGOs operating in Iraq with a very low security profile. Uh, I think Mercy Corps will probably talk much more about the need for humanitarian space and how they face security issues. What is the appropriate liaison, bet you know, between working with the military in a counterinsurgency environment and protecting NGO staff? Uh, how do we have that balance? And then finally, coordination, which is always an issue. <laughs> um, I have to say in my career, I've never been so coordinated in my life as I have been on Iraq. That said, you know, the lessons learned of programming are that, you know, we still are capable of stepping on each other when we are out in the field. Uh, one of the things that was found throughout the life of the program is, you know, SERP activities could be doing one thing and then CSP be starting to replicate it, or perhaps they're going in different directions, or perhaps the military is aware of a contractor who has a dubious background, but maybe the civilians are not aware. There are a number of, of competing issues on the ground, and how do you best coordinate that? Again, IRD was implemented, have primarily Iraqi staff implementing this program. So for them to go to a PRT, very risky. And so how do you create that coordinating mechanism so that everyone is safe and yet we don't step on each other? Also, one of the interesting issues that were raised here in, in the evaluation is competing institutional objectives. Uh, as development workers, our goal is capacity development. We want to pass off activities to beneficiaries, the communities, their leaders, to assume responsibility for as quickly as possible. So, for example, in CSP, uh, CSP was doing a large amount of Baghdad trash collection. And it was time then to transition that back to Iraqi authorities to assume responsibility for that. And IRD worked very hard to bring that about. And we declared it a success. I think we even referenced this in um, Ambassador Crocker's testimony a year or so ago. Um, as a success story that we had transitioned trash collection back to Iraqi authorities. A few months ago, I was briefing a group of military colleagues who were about to deploy out to Baghdad, and one of them happened to mention a SERP activity that was under consideration that was doing, or proposing to do, trash collection in Baghdad. So I, I, I looked at her in just dismay. I thought, oh no, this is you know, undermining what we've worked so hard to do. It's important that the Iraqis do these things for themselves. But she had a very good point. IEDs are hidden in the trash. So you have two equally important but competing objectives, and how do you reconcile those two? 
And then when you add in also Iraqis, they may have a different perspective than we do. You know, we want to get into a new neighborhood and get it up and running and move on. They have to live there. So their approach may be very different from ours, and we have to figure out how best to reconcile those two. And I think we'll close it there so we can move on to other panelists and hear their perspective. We'll now uh, invite uh, brief remarks from uh, discussants, starting off with Rand Algarheim. Would you like us to stand up there, or can we do it from Your choice. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to stay seated. Okay. Um, <coughs> Jean, thank you very much. Um, of course, I have no way of, of um, assessing the success of the CSP, and I can only speak in general terms and uh, from the information that uh, – is out there in the public domain. But I want to make some, a, f a few remarks, not just about CSP, but also uh, about the entire approach that I think CSP kind of um, uh, embodies. The, uh, and I do have some experience as a, a subcontractor on USAID projects. So uh, this, it's a combination between, you know, CSP and, and my own experience. First of all, Ray started very well by saying that usually these uh, these projects, the, the uh, stabilization projects, are launched in a post-violence uh, era. In other words, once violence ceases, once fighting ceases, then you start the stabilization. CSP obviously started at the worst time uh, in uh, the... Uh, era of fighting in Iraq. 2006 is where it was launched. This was the height of the sectarian fighting, and although it was launched in all of Iraq, but it certainly had to operate in some of the worst areas like uh, uh, Baghdad and Diyala and so on. So obviously CSP had a problem from the start because it had to operate essentially in a war zone. So the post-violence uh, model was not exactly fitted to where CSP was going. And that presented, I think, probably some of the challenges that Jean spoke about. The, the most um, salient challenge is the issue of how do you deal with not only personal security, but also financial security in an environment which has a lot of insurgents. They are working underground. They're working through the social fabric. And yet you have to utilize that very social fabric in order to funnel out money and so on. How do you know the good guys from the bad guys? And it seems to me, if I am not wrong, that this is one of the, the challenges that CSP had to confront. Uh, naturally, most uh, humanitarian organizations and NGOs do not like to work with the military. They like to keep a distance between themselves and the military in a combat zone. And yet, a project like CSP going into a combat zone and working in an environment that has a lot of unknowns and that has a lot of uh, uh, traps and, and pitfalls related to security has no alternative but to work very closely with the military because that's where the intelligence comes in. CSP, I imagine, and IRD generally would not have intelligence information. The only way they can get it is through uh, the military. And, and, and this is really a question that confronts uh, humanitarian organizations, are they willing to have such a close association with the military in a war zone? This is something that each organization has to decide for itself. But in the CSP context, going into a, a fighting zone with, where there are lots of unknowns, there are lots of bad guys, and the possibility of the bad guys taking advantage of the program is very high, I think that choice had to be very clear. So coordinating with other U.S. actors, including the military, is essential in that kind uh, of environment. The uh, other issue that uh, I, I wanted to sort of bring up is the sheer magnitude of this project and the desire by US, USAID, and excuse me, Jean, if I, if I say this, to uh, generate numbers as quickly as possible. And I have to say that as a subcontractor to USAID some time ago, uh, we suffered from this, that what was focused, the focus was on 
output, 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 and is summarized by the term burn rate, which I find absolutely deplorable, I must say, because what is important is not the numbers that you generate. It is the quality of what you generate and the outcome that you generate. For example, one of the, uh, the numbers that I did pick up on CSP is that CSP uh, trained something like 207, over 207,000 youth in educational programs that were focused on conflict mitigation. Really? 207,000 in three years, really under three years when you think about it because there's a start-up period, there's a, there's a close-out period. 207,000 youth in less than three years, and that was just one part of the program? What is the quality of that training when you insist on numbers, when you insist on spending a million dollars a day? And I truly question the value of a project which insists so emphatically on numbers, on output, 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 without the notion that it's, you have to not only generate hundreds of thousands, you really need to scale down because what is important is that what you're delivering sticks, that there's a legacy there rather than something that is going to dissipate as soon as these kids walk out the door. This is, uh, I think, one of my major uh, one of the things that I sort of really uh, hold against this type of project because in the end, what is left? What is the residual value of what is being done? Um, the make work programs is another aspect of this sort of output output uh, mentality. Fine, you, we, we do uh, uh, trash cleaning in Baghdad and so on, but trash cleaning in Baghdad is good just for the day that a person is working. You're not providing any value added. You're not providing the sustainability element. You are perhaps occupying those youth for the time that they are working for your project. In other words, for those eight hours, they're not out there fighting, they're on the, in, in, the, in the garbage collection team. But essentially, if they don't come tomorrow, nothing very much happens. There is no subsidiary activity, there's no economic trickle-down, there's no creation of associated jobs, there is no sense that this job has a tomorrow, has an improved prospect, and so on. And, and I think that this type of overemphasis, let's put it this way, overemphasis on this type of make-work is perhaps uh, not so desirable, and again, in my view, it would be better to scale down and focus more on things that have a multiplier effect for the economy and represent a real future for those people who are employed. Uh, a third thing is the coordination with local authorities. Really, it, it's, it's very difficult to run a program such as this and to have any hope of sustainability unless you're working hand in glove with local authorities. And I don't know to what extent, I gather that there was some coordination with local authorities, but um, I, I don't know to what extent that was, and, and I think this is an essential component. And in addition to working with, loca working with local authorities, a program like this, which is so vast and covers the entire country, requires local partners. And I don't mean just local employees. It really requires, Iraq is full of um, NGOs. And it seems to me that one of the ways to avoid the problems that the CSP confronted is to work through local entities, not just individuals, but local groups who have penetration in their, in their community, who understand the community, who can tell the good guys from the bad guys, and who are comfortable moving around. Um, and the advantage of that is that these local partners, whether they are district uh, councils, whether they are local NGOs, can actually continue the work once IRD and the program is gone. They have, this, this is what I call the residual value of the work that you're putting in. And finally, I, this is the important thing, is uh, continuity. It seems that spending $644 million on a program 
uh, I, as a taxpayer, would like to know um, what is carried over into the future. Is there something that's going to be left behind? What is the legacy of the program? Do we have a means of measuring what has happened at the end of the program, not immediately at the end, but say in a year's time? Are we able to go back and say, okay, these are the people that we did vocational training for, this is what, we're, what they're doing, how they're working, where they're working. These are the people that we gave medium and small grants to. They have started businesses. These businesses are continuing. This kind of retrospective evaluation, I think, is very important in a program like this. And I would like to end there. Thank you very much. All right, well, good morning or good afternoon, I guess, now. Um, I, th I think what my comments will do is serve to validate what we've heard already with some specific examples uh, based on my experience. Uh, first, as a way of introduction, uh, I am an infantry officer, 17 years of service, have deployed to a variety of places, including two trips to Iraq. Um, this last rotation, I was a part of the 4th Brigade 3rd Infantry Division based at 5 Cal Sioux in uh, North Babel Province. Um, I'm accompanied today by Major Kim Peoples. Uh, she was the, op or the uh, engineer officer and also the deputy team leader for the embedded provincial reconstruction team for our brigade. So she spent a lot of time working the details uh, on CSP and other development initiatives in our area. So where I falter on any details, Kim can certainly back me up. Uh, some operational context. Uh, as we came into Iraq in November 2007, Babel province was um, – it was a very different place than it is now. In fact, it was the, the home of a very distinct Shia-Sunni fault line, especially in, in North Babel province. Um, there were places coalition forces and local security forces just did not go at that time, especially in the Euphrates River Valley on the outskirts of uh, Iskandaria, and then even over to the east in, in the Tigris River Valley. And so our rotation really started out with a focus, a military focus on kinetic operations on clearing, deliberately clearing al-Qaeda from those areas and reestablishing that freedom of movement for not only our forces but for all the local security forces. Uh, over the course of 14 months, uh, our brigade partnered with a lot of entities to include PRTs and the EPRT, to include uh, CSP uh, directors, uh, local ISF, local government officials. We, through that 14 months, we saw tremendous improvement in the province. and. Uh, Towards the end of the rotation, I guess it was October of 2008, the province actually declared provincial Iraqi control, and, and really the local leaders took charge of their own futures, and uh, again, a much better day in Babel than it was when we arrived. Uh, my primary task today is to evaluate CSP from a military perspective and, and answer the question, is CSP an effective counterinsurgency tool? And I'll tell you, my bottom line up front is I don't really know. For a lot of the reasons I already cited here today, <coughs> It's difficult to tell. Um, my gut tells me it is the kind of tool that I would like to have in my toolbox as a military commander going into an area like Babel in 2007. But the reality is I don't have any specific proof of the effectiveness of the program. Um, I think everybody here would agree that, that Iraq, like any place uh, post-conflict, is a, is a complex adaptive system with a lot of interdependent variables. and. Isolating the effect uh, of one input to that system is difficult, uh, in fact, nearly impossible. Uh, you know, our brigade, with all of its partners, saw dramatic success, but, but the success was due to a variety of factors, uh, including not only combined operations to kill and capture insurgents and the development of an effective ISF, but also the emplacement of Sons of Iraq throughout the area to to take away al-Qaeda's freedom of maneuver, and then to, to take away their base of support. And then also the application of money from a variety of sources to include SERP, ISERP, QRF, IRAP, uh, you know, to, to provide the, those jobs to boost local economy and, and to improve the infrastructure in the area. Uh, towards the end of our rotation, uh, Mr. Mike Maxey, our USAID expert, um, put together a study where he tried to define a causal link between money spent and the reductions in violence. And a valiant effort on his part, something that we all really wanted to do, but when we started to study that, we realized there, that there is no causal link. At best, you can establish some correlation, but we found ourselves quickly in that chicken and egg discussion. You know, did, 
did the drop in violence happen because of the money we spent? Or was money spent because violence dropped due to other factors at play in the area? So it's difficult, uh, if not impossible, to establish that, that link. If you look at a specific case in our area, the city of Iskandaria. Iskandaria is, a, uh, is a, an industrial city, the home of the Iskandaria Industrial Complex. It sits uh, just outside the Euphrates River Valley. It sat also right on that Sunni Shia fault line I mentioned before. And it also sits on the gateway to, to Baghdad, to South Baghdad. So the thought was the Iskandaria area was feeding a lot of the, the insurgent efforts uh, going on in the city of Baghdad itself. So naturally, Iskandaria became a focal point for CSP. So during our rotation, CSP conducted a variety of programs, all the things that we've talked about already, the employment and training programs at the uh, Iskandaria Votec, soccer tournaments throughout the area to, to get the youth occupied and, and to establish some measure of normalcy. Uh, T-wall painting projects, again, not only to, to get some folks uh, active, but also to, to improve the, uh, the appearance of the area. Micro-grant programs, school reconstruction, water projects, concerts, art festivals, the whole gamut of programs in Iskandaria itself and then in all the neighboring um, and along the outskirts of the town. But in addition to those programs, our brigade also did all those things that, we, that I mentioned before, the combined operations to clear al-Qaeda from the outskirts of the city. We had placed hundreds of SOIs on dozens of checkpoints to, to take away al-Qaeda's freedom of maneuver. We partnered an entire U.S. infantry battalion with all the key leaders of security forces, government officials, uh, industrial complex officials within the city itself. So a lot of military combat power focused on improving that area. And, of course, naturally, as, as security improves, it targets some key segments of the population that are susceptible to uh, insurgent influence. Uh, perhaps most attractive to me is the fact that it's managed by somebody else. <laughs> and not only is it managed by somebody else, but it's managed by some experts, some people who are truly trained to do those kind of programs uh, the right way the first time. And then... It's designed to be more sustainable than what the military has at its immediate uh, call. It's, it's designed to be more sustainable than CERP, certainly. And it's designed to be more sustainable than some of the other programs that I mentioned. may not be as sustainable as we want, and I'm sure we'll talk about that here later today. But for all those reasons, CSP is attractive to me. So even without definitive proof of its effectiveness, I would say – as a military man, that's, that's something I would like to see for future operations, whether that be Afghanistan or some other theater. Several friction points, of course, with any program of this magnitude. We mentioned a lot of them already. Uh, at the outset of our operation, I'll tell you that my brigade knew very little about CSP. Certainly didn't know about the program. We definitely didn't know what specific CSP projects were ongoing as we came into the area. We knew the EPRT and PRT folks uh, had some tabs on it, but it, it was evident right up front that there had not been any kind of focused effort, a focused campaign to employ CSP and target it at specific areas in conjunction with ongoing operations in other areas. Uh, the program directors reported to Baghdad, and so they had little interaction with a lot of the local uh, authorities and had little interaction really with our local EPRT and PRT. Uh, classification issues hampered true collaboration. Um, I mean, that's, it's one of the things we as a military have to become more comfortable with. We, we probably overclassify, and, you know, there's, there's a middle ground there definitely, uh, certainly hampered collaboration in a variety of forms. Uh, project fratricide was common, and we, we talked about it already. Uh, you know, the poor Iraqi sitting in Escondaria was probably approached three or four different times by different people. One guy wearing a green suit saying, how can I help? Give me your prioritized list of projects. Next day by a CSP rep saying, how can I help? Give me your prioritized list of projects. And on and on. And, you know, it, it doesn't take too long for that individual person to become frustrated. And in some cases, uh, some of the locals took advantage of that, that fratricide among all the different entities. 
And then finally, on the military side, our commanders, I think, got frustrated just because they saw a long lead time in getting some of these things going. And on the, on the tail end, on the heels of kinetic action, that's one of the things that, that our military guys are looking for is that immediate shift to development. And again, there are limitations on the, the tools at immediate uh, hand. So knowing that our, our goal today is to talk about how to improve these kind of programs, I'll offer a few recommendations. Uh, I think the number one thing that we must do is achieve unity of effort. Uh, easier said than done. Uh, a big part of that is establishing relationships between all the key players before we get into an environment, uh, a post-conflict type environment. Um, a lot of ways to do that, and I can talk about those later in detail. Uh, on the military side, we have to educate our folks on what's on CSP and all those other types of uh, initiatives out there. Uh, I think it's critical that we link CSP to the EPRTs and the PRTs. I think the PRT model is a good model. Uh, I think we saw a lot of success in Iraq, and I think they're seeing the same success in Afghanistan with that model. I think uh, by linking CSP more directly with those entities, I think we can achieve a better um, unity of effort. Uh, achieve unity of command by clearly defining who's in the lead at different phases. There are definitely times when it's appropriate for the military entities to be in the lead. And then there has to be a transition at some point. That transition may be different in the different geographic areas. And then finally, I think there has to be a more direct link between CSP and the more immediate programs like SERP. Um, I'll end it there. Um, look forward to the discussions. And um, probably more importantly, I look forward to exchanging business cards with some of the folks here to to make that initial um, bridge of, of the gap and, and make those initial relationships. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming this morning to this discussion. Is this on? It is. Great. It's great to see so many people here because this really is an issue that's at the core of U.S. foreign assistance strategies um, and the relationship between the civilian arms of the U.S. government and the military as we move forward in an environment where the number of weakened, failed, and failing states is growing. And um, in theaters like Afghanistan, our, our policymakers have very important decisions to be made. So I'm glad to see the interest in this particular topic. I'm the Director of Public Affairs at Mercy Corps, and Mercy Corps works in 38 countries all over the world. Most of them are pretty high on the list of weak and failing states because we've defined our area of work as being transitional environments. We believe that at moments of chaos and crisis, there's also profound opportunities for transformation that can build more productive, just, and stable societies. And our methods are really based on our vision for change which involves accountability, participation, and peaceful change, and involves public sector, private sector, and civil society actors. Um, our approach is based on goals related to the challenges of building successful development programs in transitional environments. And we see these places as fertile ground for implementing what we call complex development. Some people have talked about humanitarian agencies, and I want to emphasize that in these environments, it's usually not just about providing humanitarian, life-saving assistance. And yet, the institutional structures that need to be in place for effective long-term development to move forward are not yet there. And I think it is that area between emergency humanitarian assistance and stability, which would allow for long-term development efforts to take place, that provides such uh, tremendous challenges to U.S. policymakers and implementers. Mercy Corps believes that the activities involved in counterinsurgency and complex development resemble each other closely in some settings, like Iraq and Afghanistan. But the end goals and the interim methodologies of these two different approaches are not the same, and we should not confuse them. We also believe that when successfully implemented, complex development programs yield results in terms of stability that are similar to the results of successful counterinsurgency programs. However, we're also convinced that for complex development programs to be successful, they must be successfully differentiated from counterinsurgency programs. 
We work in a lot of tough operating environments where the only people on the ground will be the U.S. military, humanitarian agencies, maybe a couple of journalists. And so we're used to coordinating closely with the U.S. military. We've coordinated closely with them in developing the guidelines that uh, USIP helped to develop for interactions between NGOs and militaries. But we also believe that the effectiveness of complex development hinges on our ability to maintain independence and to have clear program goals that are not military goals. <clears throat> Today I'm going to share a little bit of historical background of Mercy Corps' programs in Iraq. And I'm also going to present some preliminary findings from research that we're now completing in Iraq and Afghanistan, examining how community-led approaches to complex development are contributing or not to increase stability in those settings. Mercy Corps began working in Iraq uh, right after the 2003 inva invasion, and at that time we considered applying for many of the programs available. Uh, USAID is a very valued partner of Mercy Corps, not just in Iraq, but in many other settings. And we essentially decided not to apply for the CSP program, but to apply for another program called the Community Action Program which we've been implementing since then with several other partners who I'll name in a minute. I won't go into it too much, but basically the decision to not apply for CSP funding hinged on, on two factors for Mercy Corps. And the first was we felt the scope of the program, the magnitude of the program, went beyond our ability and capacity on the ground to implement it with a high degree of accountability and really program success. And the second was that we felt it would tie us much too closely to U.S. military goals in Iraq and not allow the degree of independence that, that we'd like to have when we implement development programs. We have implemented the CAP program with IRD, CHF, ACDI, VOCA as valued partners. Um, and this program is now in the third round of funding, and it's had substantial impacts in all the governorates of Iraq. In the first phase of CAT, Mercy Corps alone completed 557 community projects worth over $38 million. So it's not a small program either. It's just not a million-dollar-a-day program. As well as successfully obtaining matching funds from local community and government sources worth about 20% of that overall funding. So right from the inception, we were looking for communities and local governments to match the funding provided uh, by CAT programs. We assisted 188 communities reaching over 3 million beneficiaries, created over 21,000 short-term jobs, 695 long-term jobs. During the second phase of CAP, which was 2007-2008, I'm sorry I'm going through this rather fast. It's just to give some background, but I, I have some questions for discussion that I want to get to. Counting the activities of all the implementing partners I just mentioned, uh, 1,673 community projects were completed. Over $5.5 million of matching funds were secured from Iraqi sources to support these projects. And more importantly, the community action groups that we formed as part of project methodology all over the country were involved in training programs. 270, uh, 207 community action groups received training in conflict resolution, 396 in how to effectively engage local Iraqi government officials and provincial government officials in order to secure funding for projects that were the priority in their communities. And a total of 477 community action groups were engaged with government officials to solve community problems. 470 of those groups had leveraged government funding for their activities. Also during CAP3, 7,500 individuals received job training over 60,000 short-term jobs and about 17,000 long-term jobs were created. Now, I ran through all those stats relatively quickly because just like any other uh, U.S.-funded program, we really do try to keep track of the activities that we're implementing in the CAP program. But I wanted to put some numbers out there to make the case that the CAP program is essentially a program like CSP, but working under a different model. And I, and I want to put that out there because I think sometimes in these insecure environments, the idea that we come into this with is that the only way to do these programs is in close collaboration with the U.S. military. And Mercy Corps believes that while we can coordinate and should coordinate at all times with U.S. military forces in the area, there are ways to seek out a more independent road forward um, that's more focused specifically on the goals of community-led development. Um, 
a lot of times we do talk about the differences in terms of our security protocols and procedures and how we work. I'm not going to go into that today because what I really want to focus on is sort of the effectiveness measures um, for these programs. I think the presentations today have shown that both CSP models and CAP models can produce real impact and real positive changes on the ground. But at Mercy Corps, we believe that the CAP example also shows that these efforts can be coordinated but also have a level of independence. We believe that while the security benefits of the different models are likely similar, the long-term benefits to be had from more independent civilian-led complex development activities are too o often overlooked in Washington. So in recent years, we've been undertaking a series of studies to try to measure some of these results, and I wanted to just mention two of those briefly today. The first is what we call the sustainability study. With USAID funding, Mercy Corps implemented several large-scale multi-year community-led development uh, transitional community recovery programs in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. After these programs ended, we decided one to five years later, depending because they, they were staged programs, the evaluation was all done at once, one to five years after they ended, we went back to interview people to see if any of the results had stuck. And we were really amazed by the findings. In 93% of the communities surveyed, the projects completed were still being actively used and maintained by community members. We also found real increases in terms of community participation. Members of community action groups in 61% of the communities reported unprompted that people were now more willing to participate in actions aimed at the benefit of the entire community. Roughly half of all those interviewed said that they had attended at least one community member in the last year. And 73% of them said it was more easy for their local community groups to work with local government officials. 68% said that local government officials were now paying closer attention to the needs that community members felt. <laughs> so with this as background, we decided to conduct an additional research in Afghanistan and Iraq. And this has actually been pretty difficult. Anyone who's done research in conflict settings knows that. Um, we've been working with GlobeScan, an internationally renowned research firm, and locally contracted firms in Afghanistan and Iraq to conduct qualitative and quantitative research in both settings, looking at the value add of community-led development models in creating more rapid stabilization. And we're just having initial findings right now. Our full findings should be launched in January. Um, my time's almost up, so I just wanted to touch on a couple things. Um, according to focus group participants in Afghanistan, they think development programs are effective when there's a, a, a large sense of ownership and also a sense of trust with implementing organizations. But our quantitative research showed that in terms of levels of trust, those mo the actors that are most well trusted are the Shura, international NGOs, and religious leaders, while those least trusted are international military forces. In Iraq, we've only begun to analyze the quantitative data, but the findings from our qualitative data suggest that the involvement and level of involvement of community members and leaders in ways consistent with local customs and traditions is really very highly rated as essential to program success. So I think what's clear from that is the process of involving people in charting their own futures is essential, both for complex development and I would argue also for counterinsurgency efforts. However, a lot of essential questions remain unanswered, and I just want to pose a couple in closing my presentation. The first is, what do we really gain by pulling the mission of USAID ever more closely to military goals? There may be things that we do gain, um, but I think it's important that we pose that question. And on the other hand, what do we lose in terms of the long-term sustainability of program efforts when our development uh, mission takes on a shorter-term set of goals and more immediate military objectives? The other is how to gauge success, and many have talked about this. I find it heartening that burn rate is being uh, – it's suggested that burn rate should no longer be the indicator of success. Um, it's definitely at odds with building the sustainability of, of projects. And finally, many of you probably have heard Andrew Wilder's uh, presentations these days, his research on does aid win hearts and minds in Afghanistan. And I mean, I think his essential answer is that no, it doesn't, and that less is often more. But I, I just want to pose the question, 
a little differently, um, and that is I, I think we need to look much more closely and ask under what conditions, with what kind of end goals, with what kind of implementation methodologies, and with what kind of organizations carrying out the work can we expect the most positive impacts from our aid dollars. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Now I invite Nabil for the uh, fourth and uh, hopefully briefest uh, intervention. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I think in, uh, in, the, in my case, I might be playing the role here and meant to play the role of the wild-eyed academic, and if that's the case, then, then I'll gladly step into it. Um, but just a bit of background. Um, within this discussion, you can categorize, there are several categories of perspective to go from, and I'll just say that there's, first of all, military versus civilian. Within the civilian, you've got NGOs and U.S. government. Within the NGOs, you have relief versus development, and within the relief agencies, I would say that you have US, an, a U.S. NGO approach and often a European or sometimes it's characterized as a French NGO approach. And in a sense, that's the perspective I'm largely coming from just because of my own career background. And I should also add that my career has almost um, completely followed a, a, a bellwether change in the relationship of the military to relief and NGO activity in uh, conflict zones. Because I started in 1991 in Iraq with Catholic Relief Services right after uh, the 1990, uh, 91 Gulf conflict. And I've watched it change over time, and I'll come back to that at the end of my comments. Uh, basically, I've got three sets of comments to make, one on accountability, another one on corruption patronage, if you want to consider it patronage, uh, and then the other on military NGO cooperation, which is the strongest set of points I'd want to make. On accountability, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the CSP program, which, by the way, I'm, I'm completely an outsider. That's another thing to clarify. I've, I've got no involvement with this program at all. Um, but from what I can see, the measurables appear to, appear to be process-oriented as opposed to impact-oriented. In other words, they're somewhat internal to the process of the project itself, the measurables that are being used for monitoring and evaluation. And in a sense, the, the quantifiable aspect of it that Rent pointed out, I think coincides quite nicely with things I'm seeing in the educational sector, whereby in higher education they're trying to get us to quantify everything that we do in outcomes assessment. And I just completely concur with what Rent pointed out there and say that it's even larger than just this um, theater. Another point that has already been raised is, do we have primarily here a counterinsurgency goal or a development goal? Um, and actually, the two are not the same at all, and they're sometimes contradictory, uh, although I tried to think of a completely contradictory example, and I couldn't just now. Um, but they are often contradictory, and I think if you did think about it, you will find cases. Um, all right, another point is, who, whom are we throwing money at? And, and this is effectively uh, a managed cash drop of sorts, is, is my, my take on it. And it reminds me of something I saw in Somalia in 1992, interestingly, where an OFDA official at the height of the period when Somali militias were hijacking grain shipments had a very simple response. He said, let's just flood the market with grain and, and that will inevitably change the dynamic. That was tried and if I remember correctly, it worked reasonably well, although the, the, the glass is half full on that one. Um, but this is a similar idea, I think, um, only with an added dynamic that we're a direct party to the conflict. Uh, that's different than Somalia was. Um, so asking that, um, I would suggest that folks look at Peter Moore's work on Iraq's political economy. Um, he has a lot to say about the way that Iraq's political economy actually works and the effect of the U.S. intervention broadly, you know, wrought, wrought wide, has done on, on the, has has uh, affected the Iraqi political economy. Um, so can money buy friendship and cooperation? I'm, I'm highly skeptical of that. And I also think, you know, the win hearts and minds I idea, I also think that the, the calming down of Iraq uh, since roughly the time that this program was implemented has much more to do with factors that are external to this program and in effect much larger than this program and they're, they're mostly internal to the, Iraqi, to the Iraqi public itself. So as it's already been pointed out, checking on the effect of this program is really difficult and really challenging. And I just want to say that I recognize that difficulty and, and concur. And I don't really know that you can defend um, any clear uh, conclusion. Um, also... There are occasions where I wonder whether uh, what CSP is actually doing is throwing money after 
a situation of conflict and in some cases potentially even ethnic cleansing, considering what has happened on Iraqi society itself. And, and this, this example of painting tea walls really hit me as, as uh, not, a, not necessarily a bad project in and of itself, but in the broader context of there even being tea walls, which is something Iraq had never seen prior to roughly 2005, 2006. Um, well, 2003, if you want to take the green zone itself, I suppose. Um, it, it's, it's like finding something very good in something small surrounded by something absolutely horrific. Um, and that's just, again, an external observation. All right, now moving on to the second category, corruption and, and patronage. Um, at some level, corruption is inevitable, um, and it really is, uh, especially with a program the size of 640 million, I believe it is, 650. From accounts by some that I know in the field, um, there have been hair-raising stories of corruption um, within the field. And I don't want to get too specific because that, that could prove really problematic. But um, they have to do with internationals uh, requesting kickbacks on some of these projects. And that's all I think I should say at this point. Um, and these are strong allegations, but they're not really public. Um, and the kickbacks and the patronage and the corruption is itself international. It's not not necessarily only Iraqis that are being that are corrupt, and there are also cases where the Iraqis are effectively being corrupted by the program itself because it's redirecting resources within Iraqi society. Um, there's also a lot of problematic issues regarding um, trying to redirect what Iraqi youth do with their time, and this has been pointed out in, in other parts of the literature that. Uh, there is a machismo attached to being a security uh, personnel. And if you take away that gun and offer a job, almost any job, it's not likely to succeed if only because of the importance of carrying you know, a security identity within that society. That's enough for all those categories. Now for the issue of military NGO cooperation. And first let me just sort of chart through what I've seen of the last 20 years of that relationship. It, it, to me, it, it really starts with Operation Provide Comfort in 1991. And at the time, the military simply did aid drops. And they were rather, in retrospect, comical or tragicomical because some of the pallets landed on, on those who were supposed to receive the aid drops. That was the military's first intervention in, in humanitarian assistance. Um, later on in Somalia, which I saw, uh, various military actors provided very valuable logistical assistance, things like using a military bulldozer to cover up a lime pit. Um, and they did provide security. This is another intervention because they were providing security for humanitarian workers. Then fast forward to 1999, um, in both the Kosovo uh, conflict and in the Istanbul earthquake, I witnessed um, U.S. military getting involved in humanitarian assistance at a very basic level, relief, uh, relief assistance, and then again in the uh, tsunami and the Pakistan earthquake later on. The thing is, though, it's really gone up to a level that's far more extreme than any of those examples in, say, the last three to five years, so much so that I have a friend who is, uh, or a colleague who is teaching at a service academy and reports that there are now service academy students who are entering the military in the hopes of engaging of a, of a Peace Corps type career through AFRICOM. And I find that highly problematic on many, many levels. And this is why. And this, is, this will be the sort of stirring last point, is that there is such a thing as humanitarian space. And humanitarian space may not particularly matter to the interests of the US government. It may not particularly matter to the interests of the US military, because their goals can be achieved effectively without humanitarian space. The problem is it's knock-on effects for non-military um, actors in the field. And I can say with complete confidence that in 1991 um, and 1993 in Somalia, as a relief worker, we were never, ever targeted as relief workers. There were those who were targeted because they became politicized. There were others who might have been targeted because of direct personal corruption. That could happen. But just as a relief worker, it was impossible to imagine in the early 90s. Now it's so routine that there are, there are basically no go zones for humanitarian NGOs uh, unless under the protection of the military, which in turn uh, identifies them with the military even further. Um, I could expand on that perhaps in the Q&A, but I think I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, thank you very much to our 
pre presenter and our panelists. I think what we have here is a broad consensus of, uh, around the importance of community stabilization programs in non-permissive environments such as Iraq. Uh, we also have um, broad agreement that these um, initiatives could be impactful if they're targeted and they are well um, implemented and executed in these areas. And uh, Measures of that are the degree to which there is community buy-in, the degree to which there is a sustainability element, and the degree to which there is openness and transparency in the processes. Um, where we have some divergence um, is whether or not we um, have competing and probably contradictory um, objectives between the development and the military. We also have some divergence um, around the um, issue of um, humanitarian space. How important is it? How critical is it to success? And also, uh, when it comes to measuring progress in these areas, um, these are issues, I think, that we would like to um, discuss a bit uh, further and engage both um, you, the um, audience, and our esteemed panel. Um, we have time for a few questions. And what we'll do is we have a microphone on this, on this um, side. We would um, invite um, sets of four questions, and then we'll have the um, panel respond. But before we have our first question, I'd like to invite – oh, we have two microphones, excuse me. So we'll have two on this side, two on, two on that side for the first round. But before that, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Keyes to give very brief comments because we don't really have much time on IRD's experience. Thank you, Dr. Gilpin. Uh, I feel a little bit um, like a naked person here listening to all these comments here about uh, uh, CSP. Um, but I think that uh, on balance, I think they're very good and they're very constructive. Um, I would say that um, first thing I think I would say is in terms of uh, is this appropriate for a development agency to be involved in uh, counterinsurgency? I said, my view is it's not either or. Uh, I was uh, at the original – ICAP uh, Community Action Program uh, conference in June of uh, 2003, along with the other agencies, and IRD was first on the ground setting up our programs. Our staff for, at, since June of 2003 have been there uh, in the red zone, uh, and uh, we think that uh, I can agree with uh, uh, what was said here in terms of different ways of approaching development, but I don't think it's either or. I think the reality was that the reason why CSP was undertaken and why it was uh, such a big program is because it was a big job to be done. It was not a small job to be done. And the, the comment was made that sometimes uh, less is more. I can agree with that. But it's also true that sometimes less is less. And I think that also has to be taken uh, into account. Uh, burn rate is one indicator. It's certainly not the only indicator. Uh, but it is an indicator of activity. And I think CSP, if I were to uh, try to convey anything to you, was how robust this program was. Uh, at the beginning, it was only in Baghdad, but then it grew into 18 cities. There were 1,800 people involved uh, as staff at one point. Uh, all these projects were done with a very professional approach. We used the same staff on our bidding and our procurement and our tendering on the uh, CSP that we used uh, on the ICAP program. And I can uh, assure you there was nothing called a managed cash drop. Uh, I welcome all of you to come to our uh, records, the warehouse that we have in Amman, Jordan, uh, that's uh, three stories high, uh, has all of the uh, audited, audit and auditable uh, documents there, and uh, as any of you who work with USAID knows, they didn't change the standards. They didn't change the regulations for CSP uh, versus any other program in the world. Uh, we might ask them to, but uh, they haven't done that. Uh, so, and, I, and we have passed all audits. And you talk about corruption, you can talk about it all you want, but I can tell you one thing. Everything has passed the smell test in terms of uh, auditable standards. Uh, you know, monitoring evaluation is very important. I think there are two things, though, that can be uh, easily said. 
uh, it is a team approach. There are various factors that go together, including, which I thought was very important, the, the, the overall diplomatic piece, the overall geopolitical piece, the overall regional piece. These are all uh, very important. But I think that if you do, all the studies show that you go into the communities where CSP worked, the people in the community say that their quality of life is better today after CSP and that the level of violence is significantly decreased. Those uh, are uh, very uh, gratifying for those who were involved. There were a lot of constraints. One of the constraints was personnel, not so much on the IRD side, but on the, particularly the U.S. government and the military side. The rotations uh, often worked uh, against uh, transition and against stability. And just in closing, I would like to say that uh, uh, CSP was implemented primarily through lo local contractors. I looked at the figures last night, and uh, uh, of the $650 million, between 450 and $500 million was all spent on local contractors, local NGOs, local personnel, local businesses, local communities. Uh, I was uh, in a, give you an idea, of a car wash in Baghdad where the man put up half of the, uh, he wanted new equipment there. He had put up half of the money. We came in with the other half of the money, and he expanded his employment from 20 people in his car wash to 80 people in that car wash. Um, the most important thing maybe that was done here was this was a, a tool, just one tool, of transitioning from a demand economy to a competitive market uh, economy. And I think that can't be... Uh, underestimated as we move into the new uh, Iraqi situation. The programs and, and the vocational training were turned right over to the Ministry of Labor uh, and to the Iraqi government. The Iraqi government was up front uh, on all of these projects. Uh, we had a couple of GIs. IRD has a project in Gulfport, Mississippi. And we had a couple of GIs uh, come there as a post-Katrina project. They walked in. They were amazed. They said, I can't believe that IRD is here working in our community because we were so impressed with what you were doing out there in Ambar, helping save lives and stabilize the situation in Iraq. Thank you. Thank you very much for those perspectives. The mics are now open. Please um, identify yourselves, and if you are um, – uh, Directing your question to a uh, particular panelist, please let us know who it is. Hello, my name is Marisa Lino, and I work for Northrop Grumman Corporation. I, I wonder if you, uh, and this is really for anyone who wants to comment on it, I realize the program that you've all discussed is community focused, but Iraq's economy prior to 2003 was oil, agriculture, and some small manufacturing. And I wonder whether working with the Iraqi government in creating the programs and looking at the possibilities for jobs, whether you had any discussions about the long-term sustainability of these jobs fitting into what was once the Iraqi economy. Thank you. We'll have another question on this side. Thank you. My name is Henry Clark. I was uh, head of the Office of Provincial Affairs in Embassy Baghdad, uh, in 2007 for a number of months when this program was being uh, expanded around uh, to most of the PRTs that I supervised. And I just want to say that, that I don't think we should strain too much in trying to evaluate what this program accomplished solely by itself or as separate from all the rest of the U.S. government programs that were going on at the same time. Uh, the way it was explained to me, this was a program to serve overall U.S. goals, that there could be no counterinsurgency without an effective economic program, and it was good to have a program flexible enough to move from the initial trash, trash collection to the longer-term uh, development goals as the security situation improved. My second point is we should really view this kind of work in counterinsurgency as a decentralized affair. The uh, USAID's approach on this was to use the PRTs, to use the NGOs who were established throughout Iraq and not just in the Green Zone. 
And it's at that provincial level where the coordination is really most important. Coordination not only among the U.S. actors, but with the local uh, authorities. And I think uh, this program was great. The USAID folks that I worked with were real team players, and uh, the success of the program is the U.S. government's success, uh, not a purely mathematical model for one part of the overall effort. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Any more questions? Um, my name is Gregory Marson. I'm with the Emerging Markets Group, and I spent the last four years in Afghanistan. And I have a very short question. In what way do you think we can replicate the program and the lessons learned, apply the lessons learned from the program in Iraq and Afghanistan? Thank you. Okay. I think we have uh, three questions. Um, the first relates to long-term sustainability and how the um, projects that have been initiated on the CSP um, w would relate to um, Iraq's long-term economic prospects and whether or not there are any discussions on this, uh, and even if we – whether or not we know what – how do we um, – how would, how would you suggest uh, we go about ensuring that these um, syn synergies are made? Um, the second, I think, were a couple, couple of very good comments that um, CSP should be viewed within the context of uh, broader um, efforts in Iraq, and it's not a standalone. And in evaluating or analyzing its components, we should take, we should take um, what the um, efforts of other USG entities and other players in theater into account, and uh, the notes uh, and, the, and uh, the question also um, noted that um, counterinsurgency should be viewed as a decentralized um, effort. And thirdly, in terms of replication, whether or not you agree or disagree, how do you think? Um, what lessons do you think we could take from the CSP um, in relation to um, Afghanistan, for instance? I'm going to start with Rend. Are you leaving right now? Because she has she, she she has to leave, so I'll give her the first the first uh, <laughs> any one of the three just very brief yeah, comments. Yeah. Um, I, I I do appreciate the comments of the, of the lady from London Grumman. Uh, I think uh, first of all I absolutely uh, uh, appreciate your pointing out that the issue of sustainability. One really does need to have a continuity in these programs and know that something is going to be left behind uh, that is permanent and that has a multiplier effect for the people and for the economy. And, and perhaps one of the best ways, as you mentioned, is to look to work with the local government, to work with the national government, to look at their sort of strategic plan for economic development in a particular region. Uh, this could be on a very local level. It could be on a larger level looking at what a community sees it as, as its uh, economic future and working through that so that you are not out on left field doing something that is not really relevant to the overall, overall picture. Uh, I think this would help uh, a great deal in that. As for the, the um, taking a program like this into Afghanistan, uh, I think there's been a lot of discussion about the uh, strengths and the weaknesses of this program. And if, in fact, USAID has done this lessons learned and done an evaluation, that, that is the best thing. And I actually look forward to seeing that evaluation because I think that is really what one needs to look at in order to think of transferability. And, and I apologize, but I do must, I must excuse myself. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. We'll start at the other end of the table with Nabil and walk out with you. I'm just very brief comments on any one of the um, two questions. Um, re regarding the sustainability um, issue and, and the prospects for the future, I think my perspective on that is, again, look at, look at the, the broader picture in that um, Iraq's economy, as long as there is such a thing as oil, which may end in 50 or 70 years or something, as long as there is such a thing as an oil economy, it has nothing to do with CSP as a legacy. I think CSP's legacy in the long term is going to be very, very light, um, and, and, and that's, that's what I think about that. On Afghanistan, um, you know, here's the, the sort of point where you ask, well, what do you do next? Uh, and I unfortunately do not have uh, the magic bullet from some kind of opposing view, 
except to say that I do think that there should be a separation of the military and the civilian. I, I, this is, by the way, not anti-military by any stretch, and I think there are those within the military who would agree with this perspective, that basically the military should sharpen its focus on security provision, because once security provision is attained, the rest becomes possible. Um, so that the, the more the military engages in humanitarian affairs, the more like Microsoft they become. And that's not a compliment. Um, so that basically they should concentrate on what they do best historically, and that is security provision. Um, so for Afghanistan, if there is a different idea, it is that I think uh, energy should be put towards civilian relief, and it should be need-driven, not uh, counterinsurgency-driven. Uh, which will have its own knock-on effects on counterinsurgency. And I think that it should be done through non-governmental partners to the extent possible. Uh, and it's not always going to be easy to, to imagine that in any, in any case. And the main reason is because the more that humanitarian assistance becomes militarized, the more the military gets into it, not only does it um, muddy the waters for the military, um, the military profession or the military goals, it also... Um, by squeezing out the humanitarian space, makes it so that anyone involved in the theater in question is almost by definition identified with the military endeavor, which just endangers everyone there, whether or not they are, in fact, involved with the military endeavor. Thank you. Evan? I'll also address the last question, <clears throat> whether it should be replicated in Afghanistan. And I think this is really a question of costs and benefits. Like most U.S. policy decisions, there's no real silver bullet. There's no magic to be done here. And I just want to talk about a couple of the costs that we see in Afghanistan right now that are uh, potentially emerging. These are costs associated with a, what I consider to be a big spend joint civ mill set of programs implemented by the U.S. government. I think that in terms of security, I would agree with what Nabil has just said. Um, when the civilian and military missions are not separate, it does sometimes jeopardize the security of civilians that rely on community acceptance strategies in order to accomplish their goals. At the same time, it creates an environment where accompaniment is always needed, military accompaniment is always needed, and that's a very expensive option for U.S. Uh, foreign policymakers. I think as soon as an environment becomes permissive, we need to think about staging down the levels of military accompaniment, both because in our survey work we've seen that local community members really want security to be consistent with the risk. They don't like excessive security coming out to accompany development programs, um, but also because of cost considerations. But the other thing I would say about the Big Spend Totally Merged Joint Civ Mill model is that it's raised several questions for us which we don't have the answers to but which we ask ourselves every day in terms of sustainability and in terms of effectiveness. In some areas where it's, it's easier for local government officials to get money from PRTs than it is to get money from the Afghan government, the central Afghan government or the central Iraqi government, one of the questions it raises for us is, does this model have the potential to create parallel governance structures and thereby not encourage the growth of the institutionality that we'd want to see in those environments? We have similar questions on the civil society level. Some of the civil society groups that we work with that are required to actually have very active participation, take ownership for projects, maintain projects, and also contribute community levels of funding, some of them actually feel like you know, these other pots of money that come from the U.S. government are a better deal because they don't require as much accountability and, you know, they're, they're bigger pots of money. And so does that create perverse incentives? That's another question that we have. Thanks. Uh, first to the, uh, the initial question on uh, sustainability. You know, in Iskandaria, one of the things we struggle with, you know, the Iskandaria industrial complex was a military complex. It was designed to create uh, weapons and munitions. Obviously, that was not going to be the role for Iskandaria in the future. Um, so one of the big discussions we had is what will Iskandaria become? Uh, what are those industries we can start up that, that are sustainable given the skill sets that were in the area, um, you know, from the previous uh, industry? Uh, you know, they looked at, at building civilian buses, uh, other vehicles, tractors, um, and then as they dug into it, they realized that where they thought there were some skills resident in the area, 
a lot of the folks with those skills had, had since departed and found other lines of work. Uh, one of the industries we did find some sustainability was in agriculture. Agriculture was not going away. Babel Province was, uh, was rich with, um, with an agricultural history. And so toward, towards the end of, uh, of our, uh, our tour there, we, we did focus on, on that sector, trying to find those things that would be sustainable. Uh, looking to the Afghanistan issue, um, while I would, um, would love to separate the military from, from all the development uh, initiatives, I just don't think we have that luxury. I think the reality is there, is there are so many points of interdependence between all the different entities working development and between the counterinsurgency efforts that are typically led by the military. Um, we, 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 just can't, we just can't wish that away and, and try to stay separate. So the reality is we have to find ways to, to work that together. Um, you know, I mentioned a unity of effort. You know, that unity of effort needs to happen at all levels. And, uh, you know, one of the key pieces to that is bringing all those stakeholders together to define the way ahead and then to routinely come back and look at that plan and adjust as the situation changes and to redefine which of those entities is in the lead in particular areas given the, this, uh, the scenario. Um, th there are definitely cases where those non-government organizations or other government organizations need to take the lead and need to go out without military security uh, accompanying them. Uh, on the military side, we need to be humble enough to say that's absolutely the case. Tell us what we can do to support you, but we're going to back off and let you take the lead. In other cases, it's, it's more appropriate and um, probably more beneficial for the military to be more directly involved. Uh, but again, I just don't think we have the luxury of, of creating that divide and saying that we're going to we're going to uh, work on two separate uh, sides of that equation. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, in terms of the long-term jobs, you have touched on an issue near and dear to USAID's heart in Iraq, and we hope that it will be a stronger focus in our program in the coming years. Um, I think CSP really did an excellent job of trying to focus on long-term jobs you know, we had a political imperative. We had the surge going on. We had these communities under great stress. So there was enormous pressure to generate short-term employment, again, you know, for the reasons that I had mentioned, uh, getting cash into the economy, keeping young men engaged. But there was a very strong component in CSP that looked for that long term, the, the business, um, business grants. Uh, I believe the evaluation found that the majority of those businesses were still in existence a year later. So I think that is a good example of how this program can be sustainable over time. Vocational training is always a challenge. Uh, it's a challenge the world over to make sure that what you're training people in is actually the skill sets needed in the local economy. Uh, but the CSP program really em emphasized some very practical trades, you know, plumbing, masonry, electricity, IT. So. And then there was also an apprenticeship program that was intended to help people transition into permanent long-term jobs. But CSP really isn't the only economic growth program that USAID has. We do have some longer-term economic growth programs. Um, oil is inevitably going to be the source of revenue. That's not going to change anytime soon. It is not a source for jobs. Agriculture and agribusiness is an underutilized sector that has great potential to generate many more long-term jobs. Uh, we have a, a strong agribusiness program that looks at the whole value chain of farm, farm to market. You know, what, what products does Iraq have a comparative advantage in? How do you build in value added, such as food processing, so that you can generate more jobs and more income? How do you make sure it gets to the market and then it is sold in the market? We also have a private sector development program that has um, established microfinance institutions in all 18 governance. Four, uh, four NGO, international NGOs work in this program, but more importantly, seven Iraqi NGOs are running microfinance institutions in Iraq. We have also just recently transitioned into expanding uh, credit for small and medium enterprises using a consortium of Iraqi private banks. And we'd like to build on all of these programs and expand them in the future to get at the issue that you raised. In terms of replication, you know, we've shared the evaluation with our Afghanistan colleagues, and they've participated in the discussion. Actually, one of our former staff on this program in Baghdad is now 
in our aid mission in Afghanistan. So we're having a lot of lessons learned exchanged. Um, I do think it's relevant to Afghanistan, but it must take into account the Afghan context. You know, in, in Iraq, this was targeted to urban areas, and Afghanistan is really going to need to focus on the rural areas, and that's going to require a different approach. Um, probably other than small businesses, the focus will probably have to be more on micro-businesses or, or agriculture. So there will have to be adjustments to be made. It's also an opportunity to, you know, think about some of the lessons learned that have come out of it. You know, is there a way, you know, IRD did an excellent job in terms of working with local communities and implementing this program. Is there a way to deepen that in Afghanistan? And how do you work out the issues of humanitarian space? So I think Afghanistan could be a next step for us in and testing these different theories and programs out. Thank you. We've actually overrun, but I'm going to use my prerogative to go for another six to seven minutes. Uh, that will give us just enough time to take two brief questions <laughs> from um, uh, the right and from the director of Iraq programs on the left. Hi, my name is Damon Taylor. I'm unaffiliated. Um, question that was sparked by Lieutenant Colonel Burnaby when he was talking about some of the frictions, one of which was the slow lead time and the unfolding of, of the development effort. The question relates to process planning um, and process. How, how was the CSP project or program affected by pre-kinetic operation planning? Uh, it seems to me that AID, DOD, other various agencies are all part of the larger tool belt when we implement various policies. Uh, so my, my first question is planning. Could we have just one, please? Sure. Yeah. Um, just curious about pre-kinetic operation discussion and planning and how it was impacted by or how it impacted the CSP operation. Thank you. Rusty. Hi, uh, I'm Rusty Barber with USIP. Um, I was wondering if you could just uh, answer a very basic question. It's probably a reflection of my own ignorance, but the difference between the CAP program and the CSP program, the Community Action Program, and I remember I was confused about this when I was – uh, at the time in Iraq with USIP, and if, uh, because it perhaps is a question for Dr. Hansen, since you chose that program over CSP, so presumably in large part because it gave you some distance from military operations. So if these were both, it struck me at the time that they were doing very similar activities, and, very, and if they had similar objectives, what were the difference in approaches, and has anybody done, if they are that similar, has anybody done any type of c comparison analysis uh, between them? Okay, um, very brief responses from uh, Colonel Barnaby, um, Dr. Hansen, and then we'll have a final brief word from you, Gene. As we began uh, kinetic operations in late 2007, 2008, there really was no planning that incorporated CSP because, again, we didn't really know what CSP was up to. We hadn't made all the connections with the key players. That all didn't happen until probably six months, four to six months down the road. So we launched into kinetic operations with the tools that, that are immediate ready, the, C, the CERP type tools that, that we knew how to use and could implement with our own resources within the brigade combat team. Uh, much better would have been had, having all those key players, those key stakeholders together, planning that operation with its kinetic and non-kinetic pieces from start to finish. Never got there. Again, over the course of the months, we were able to connect the dots with all the key players and achieve a little bit better synchronization unity of effort. But we were beyond the kinetic, you know, the do predominantly kinetic pieces of our operation by then. Um, so again, looking to Afghanistan, I think that's where uh, we can improve the model if we're still conducting those types of operations, bring all those stakeholders in right up front and develop a plan that's a lot further out than just beyond the end of lethal operations. Thanks. Maybe we could have this uh, bilaterally. <laughs> Uh, very briefly, please. Since we haven't done the CSP program, <clears throat> I don't know as in, in as detailed a way what the goals and objectives of that program are, so I'm not really qualified to fully answer the question posed. But I do want to say, I think it would be extremely interesting and useful for U.S. policymakers to conduct a sort of more thorough but comparative review of the different monetary authorities used in counterinsurgency and complex development settings, because there's been really no work that compares CERP funding, 1207 funding, QSP funding, CAT funding. Um, those programs compares the goals and the objectives and the outcomes of those various programs. 
I think that that would be a really important step to take because we have a lot of tools in our toolbox and I think the approach in Washington tends to be, well, we can't get rid of any of our tools because they're all great and necessary. But in fact, as taxpayers, I think, you know, we have the right to demand that the U.S. government take a careful look and keep only those tools that are helping us to reach our foreign policy goals. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, there, there, you could see the tension in the conversation. The military says, slow lead time for CSP, but there are others that argue it moved too fast and hence you're missing out on quality in thorough, true community development. This is the tension we're wrestling with in these kinds of programs, and there's no good answer, no right answer, but all opinions are welcome to help think this one through. Um, and as Arthur has pointed out, although CSP was a unique program in a very complex environment, it was subject to all the rules and regulations regarding procurement and financial management and oversight that a standard development program in Tanzania has to follow. Um, so inevitably, it, that's going to slow us down just because you know, we have to honor those rules. We want to account for every one of your tax dollars and make sure that you get good value for your money. So bureaucracy, how do you balance that with that imperative to move quickly? Um, in terms of the pre-kinetic operations planning, I think Arthur can cor correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of that was really happening in Baghdad. I know there was very close coordination between the aid mission and MNFI over where CSP would <laughs> expand next. You say didn't just randomly choose which city to go to. The military said, look, we're doing the surge. Baghdad and Ambar are our highest priorities. Please deploy there first. And that is what IRD did. They sent staff out to set up offices and look at programming options. Um, I think over time, uh, the program overall got better about coordinating more at that local level. But, you know, it gets back to you know, Heather's issue of the humanitarian space and finding that right balance between NGO staff and engagement with the military. And I think that's it. Yeah, I think. Well, I think it just remains for me to uh, thank you all for being part of this discussion and ask you to join me in thanking our excellent panel.